All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week. I am super, super excited for today's show. We're trying something new, something I've been wanting to do for a long time. Shout out to the guys behind the scenes who've been working really hard to make this a possibility. But We're going to do an old school film session. We're going to hit three different topics today. We're going to talk about Joel Embiid's return. And the interesting fact that in the final minutes, he did not make a field goal, but that he controlled the game on both ends of the floor. So we're going to watch that. And then after that, we're going to go into the Golden State Warriors-Dallas Mavericks game last night, which I thought was super interesting and an example of a good way to try to guard Dallas and also a potential counter that Dallas can have if they run into this type of coverage when they get to the postseason. And then at the end of the show, as a special thing, we had a mailbag question about the Indiana Pacers. So we're going to do a little film session on Pascal Siakam and how he's been torching teams around the league with inverted pick and roll. Should be a really fun show. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss film threads as well as show announcements. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops Tonight. It's also super helpful if you leave a rating and a review on that front. And last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions in those YouTube comments. Also, bear with us today. This is our first time using this particular type of format. So obviously, there's going to be some hiccups. The idea here is to get it all lined up so that we're good to go when we get to the postseason. We're just going to try it and see how it goes. All right, let's get started. So obviously, Joel Embiid, a little bit sloppy and and uh, uh, kind of rusty, as you would expect, coming back from being away from the game for that long. But the main thing I want to hit on today is just the way that Joel Embiid's absurd physical tools is one of the biggest and strongest centers in the league and how that kind of allows Philly to have the ability to win in a rock fight type of setting, even when shots aren't falling. So we're going to go over some clips. This is the last time that uh, this is the last time that Joel Embiid uh, made a field goal in the Oklahoma City game. So as you can see, we're going to get a, a, uh, a Kelly Oubre ball screen with Joel Embiid here on the left side of the floor. And we're going to get our classic little pick and, pick and roll, kind of short roll jump shot for Joel Embiid. It's obviously great just to see him back out there and making that type of shot. But here at 3 minutes and 20 seconds left, tied at 101, we're not going to get another Joel Embiid made field goal in this game. And yet he dominated the game on both ends of the floor. So let's get into it. So we're going to start with the concept of Joel Embiid's ball denial. This is something that I've always found super interesting about uh, Embiid, especially since the Denver game. If you guys remember, one of the ways that Embiid kind of blew up Denver's offense at the end of that game was with the ability of Embiid to deny high post entries for Nicole Jokic. Just He's so damn big that when he goes to a three-quarter front, and again, a three-quarter front is when you just kind of lean on the guy's side and put your arm out there, it makes that pass difficult. So we're going to see Oklahoma City is going to set up in a horn set here. So the way that the horn set works, you've got uh, Isaiah Joe here on the left elbow and you've got Jalen Williams. I think he's trying to set an Iverson screen so that uh, Isaiah Joe can kind of come over the top and kind of catch with an advantage with the guy trailing as he comes over to this elbow, but he doesn't set a very good pick. Uh, so he kind of just ends up running over there. The next step in the action is to make this kind of high post entry here to Jalen Williams. But look at Joel Embiid, three-quarter front. He's leaning way over the top. He's making that pass difficult. Also, shout out to Kelly Oubre. He's doing a really nice job applying some ball pressure and making that pass difficult as well. As that then, then as he tries to create the opposite angle, Embiid goes over to the other side and denies him that way. There's no entry pass there. And so Dort has no choice but to bail on the play entirely and try to work his way to the rim. Embiid is at above the three-point line, and he recovers all the way back to the rim and ends up getting a verticality, no foul contest, and forces the turnover. And so that's an example of ball denial at the high post and how that can actually blow up an action and force a guy like Lou Dort to kind of go AWOL, essentially, and just and, and try to save the possession. And then just an unbelievable defensive recovery from Joel Embiid. All right. <clears throat> On this next possession... We're going to get a Tobias Harris miss and a little bit of a transition push from Oklahoma City. And what we're going to see in this case is Joel Embiid bothering multiple cuts and drives to the rim on the same possession. So in this case here, we have Isaiah Joe coming over the top and Kyle Lowry gets caught up on the screen. And so Isaiah Joe could break open here along, along the back line, but Embiid kind of just drops back a little bit and makes himself available in that passing lane. Then we're going to get a dribble handoff to Lou Dort. 
And another dribble handoff here to Aaron Wiggins. Watch uh, Joel Embiid switch onto Aaron Wiggins here as he gets downhill and shut him off at the rim and force him into a really difficult turnaround fadeaway jump shot. And then he cleans up the defensive glass. So again, no made field goals, but dominating the game on the defensive end. All righty. We just saw this one, so we're going to skip this one. All right, now we're going to go over to the offensive end of the floor. We're going to get a Joel Embiid post up here on the left block. And we're going to get a double from the top side here from Aaron Wiggins. Move this over here. Now, Joel Embiid makes the nice kick out past Kyle Lowry, and now the defense is in rotation. I often talk about windshield wiper rotations. Windshield wiper rotations are when these guys are already ready to go in rotation, meaning while Chet is coming here, Lou Dort should theoretically already be making this sprint out to Tobias Harris. Isaiah Joe should be making this sprint out, and then as soon as Embiid makes his kick out, Aaron Wiggins should be sprinting down to tag Nicole, uh, uh, Nick Batum. And so essentially, if you rotate like that, in quick succession, you can take away the advantage, but the Thunder are a little bit slow, and so Tobias Harris gets a wide-open three. This is a wide-open three that is directly generated from Joel Embiid drawing a double team on the left block. But Joel Embiid, again, just physical tools. We've got a missed shot here. This is a rock fight. Not a lot of shots are going in. Embiid just gets over the top and gets the offensive rebound. And then this is an example of great footwork. So Joel Embiid looks like he's going to a right shoulder fade, right? We got a textbook kind of pivot move around this pivot foot. He's going to go to a right shoulder fade, but right when he goes up, he pump fakes and takes a step through. Watch Jalen Williams here. Watch as he takes, as soon as Embiid goes to the fade, watch Jalen Williams take a big step in Embiid's direction right there. Boom. Now he's in his space. And so when Embiid steps through, instead of taking the fade away, Embiid ends up getting him up underneath the spot and he draws a foul. That's one of those things. It's a footwork piece. If he just turns all the way, he's not getting that call. But because he fakes that turnaround fadeaway, he gets Jalen Williams out of position and he's able to draw the foul. And here we go. Biggest game of the uh, big, biggest play of the game. Joel Embiid switches out onto Josh Giddy and ices it with a steal and a transition push. First of all, we got the first side action there with Lou Dort. Now we're going to get a switch here as Jalen Williams sets the screen. Embiid takes Josh Giddy. He can handle him on an island. And uh, Josh Giddy exposes the ball on his left side right here. You can actually see Embiid's eyes light up, and he sees an opportunity, and he jumps in there and grabs it. Now we're pushing out the other way. And then just aggressive into Chet's body, and he draws a foul, goes to the free throw line, and our game is over. So a great example of Joel Embiid. Once again, he makes a shot there, that little pick and pop jumper with about three minutes and change left. But over the final three minutes and 20 seconds, does not make a field goal, but completely dominates the game on both ends of the floor with just his incredible defensive instincts, his size and his ability to blow up actions by denying uh, entries to certain spots on the floor. And then obviously individual defense on an island against Josh Giddy, And then just finding ways to get to the foul line, which is, again, a way to win those rock fight types of games when there aren't opportunities to make shots, when you can get defenders out of position and get to the line, that's a way to pull a game out. Very, very good to see Joel and be back out on the floor. Obviously a little bit rusty, but, man, it's just it's hard to write the Sixers off in any way, shape, or form as long as that guy is on the floor. And, again, we're just talking about one kind of like breakthrough playoff run for Embiid, and the Sixers team has a really good chance to win the title. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here, and DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. UConn is currently the favorite to win the title at plus 500. My favorite team, hometown Tucson, Arizona Wildcats, are currently plus 1,300. Plenty of good bets to check out. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. The crown is yours. All right. We're going to move on to the Warriors and the Mavs. And so before we get into the film here, I wanted to talk about what I talked about last night having to do with the... Um, having to do with the disparity between half court and transition possessions. So as I talked about the, uh, the Mavs were really successful in transition. I'm going to show you guys some clips here in a second. Actually, let's just go ahead and get into it. So 
We have here in transition. Let's actually get into our screen here. All right. So in transition, Dallas was getting great looks consistently. As you can see here, we have a turnover in the lane. Lucas pushing the ball up the floor right here. Again, as we talk about with transition principles, the basket and the ball are your primary objectives, right? So Kevon Looney has to step up to basically stop the ball on Luka Doncic. Moses Moody is keyed in on Tim Hardaway Jr. here in the right corner. And so as a result, there is a baked in rip through driving lane to Kevon Looney's left hand side. And PJ Washington does a great job of capitalizing on that catches and rips. He's, uh, it's just baked in. It's automatically there just by virtue of the fact that Kevon Looney was already on his left hand side. At this point, he's already down low and in front of Kevon Looney and has good position. Brandon Pazemski does a good job in help here, but there's just nothing he can do against a player that big coming down at him downhill, and he gets a layup at the rim. This next one was one of the ones we saw a lot in this game having to do with just Daniel Gafford's insane size that he brings to the table. And they were consistently beating them with kick ahead pass and off kick ahead passes and offensive rebounds because of Gafford's size advantage. Here we go. This is not bad offense from Golden State. Chris Paul's been shooting the three really well since he came back from his injury, but he just misses it. And on the miss, Gafford gets the contest, but on the contest, he's looking to push up the floor. If you watch Gafford, as soon as he contests, he's running. He's gone. Luca identifies this. Look where he puts this pass. Chris Paul is pointing back to Draymond Green to let him know that he needs to guard the rim. Draymond Green is there too. He's actually pointing to everybody else and trying to organize things. Draymond Green, from his perspective, he thinks he's back. He knows Gafford's there, but he's thinking, I still have this covered. Look at where Luka puts this pass. It's literally above the rim, putting it to where only Daniel Gafford can get it. And from there, where he catches that close to the basket, doesn't matter how good defensively Draymond Green is, Gafford's just too big. And so that's an easy, an easy basket that they were able, able to generate by getting out in transition. Last one, same sort of thing. We get a missed shot. It's a tough shot from Clay Thompson coming off of the screen. Now we have essentially a four on two fast break. I thought Podziemski made a really nice read here. He, he made he saw Tim Hardaway Jr. gathering. He can see the hand underneath the basketball. He sees the gather. And so he identifies that he can get back to Gafford to box out. But Tim Hardaway just makes a really nice floater. But again, good defense forced him into the toughest shot available there in transition. But Dallas was getting easy looks Anytime Golden State had a rough offensive possession, either a turnover or a bad shot, Dallas was pushing down the floor in transi transition and getting good looks. As a matter of fact, last night, Dallas's offense scored 1.14 points per possession in transition, which was 25% of their total points that they scored. And then in the half court, they scored just 0 0.862 points Per possession. So like I kind of hinted to last night, a gigantic difference in efficiency for Dallas in the half court versus in transition. And Dallas is an excellent half court offense. That's not easy to do. So let's get into the concept of why or how I should say uh, uh, Golden State had so much success against the Dallas offense. So as I mentioned last night, everything really comes down to Andrew Wiggins. Andrew Wiggins is one of the few players in the league with the physical tools, the size, the strength, the quickness, the defensive instincts to actually make life difficult on Luka. And so what I'm going to do in these next six clips is just show you the difference in comfortability between the way Luka feels going against Andrew Wiggins on an island versus the way he feels going against the other Warriors on the island. Here we're going to get a Luka ISO against Andrew Wiggins. Fights over the top of the screen. Now we're in ISO. Look at the, the the his ability to actually close this gap to make that step back jumper difficult, which is going to force Luca to drive. He can absorb the contact and prevent the bully ball. And look at that. That's actually like a little bit of a janky shot for Luca. Like that's not an easy shot for him. That's a shot you almost expect him to miss. Then as we go into this next possession. Another Luka ISO against Wiggins. Oh, we just did this one. Here 
Here we go. Another ISO against Wiggins. Watch Wiggins absorb the blows as Luka tries to play bully ball. Can absorb that contact. Force him into a pivot. He's pivoting back over his left shoulder now. Wiggins is there. He absorbs that contact too. Now, Draymond Green's going to come with late help here, but Wiggins has done a great job. Obviously, this is not solely individual defense with Draymond coming down, but I thought Wiggins did a really nice job absorbing this contact and taking away those easy shots. When he turns, Wiggins is there. And then Draymond Green is able to rotate out of it. This is actually a textbook example of a passing lane closeout from Podzemski, which we'll get to in a minute. Look, he's not closing out at Kleba. He's closing out to the passing lane to try to take away both shooters. And he's able to get there and force a tough contested corner three, corner-ish three from P.J. Washington. Last Wiggins one. This is an example of how he can kind of press up on Wig on Luca's pull up jumper. Again, this is not a very good look. This is good individual defense and a difficult jump shot for Luca that he misses badly. Now let's look at how he looks going against the other Warriors. This is a possession against Gary Payton. When Andrew Wiggins is off the floor, he's going to flash high side. Luca's just really comfortable. He's too big. He's going to get to an easy jump shot over the top. He's just not as bothered by these guys. We're going to get a switch onto Clay Thompson here in the early fourth quarter. Easier for him to get to that over the top jump shot and knock it down. This time we get Brandon Podziemski in a transition cross match. He's able to get downhill and get an easy shot in the lane. So again, the main point here is the foundational concept of what makes this work is Andrew Wiggins does really well against Luka on an island. Against most of the other teams in the league, when Luka doesn't like what he's getting out of ball screens because of the traps and the types of shots they're getting in the four on threes, he usually can just go straight ISO. And it's obviously, obviously a little bit harder to handle that as a defense than it is in a ball screen where you're actually bringing the second defender into the action. But because of Andrew Wiggins and the job that he did on Luka, he actually baited Luka into essentially playing into Golden State's hands by consistently bringing those traps. Let's get back to the film. So here we're going to get a double team of Luka. So they set a screen. Dante Exum sets a screen almost at half court. And Steph Curry is going to basically hedge. Andrew Wiggins is going to come back. So we're going to get this kickback pass to Dante Exum. Now, once again, we're going to get another passing lane closeout from Brandon Podzemski. If he just chases Dante Exum straight off the line, that's an easy extra pass to Tim Hardaway Jr. in the corner. And that's a great shooter. He's a 40% shooter in the corner this season. But instead, look at where he closes out. His first step there is literally into the gap between the two. He's playing on the fact that Dante Exum is a really good shooter, but he's got a long, slow release and is a little bit hesitant. And he gets him to hesitate. See, notice how Podziemski doesn't actually chase Exum off the line. He's in the passing lane. Now Andrew Wiggins, because he he's bought the time there because he's in the passing lane, if I, Exum throws that pass to Tim Hardaway Jr., Pazemski's picking that off. So now Dante Exum's entire approach changes and he's thinking drive the close out to this side because I'm getting an angle. This buys time for Andrew Wiggins to rotate out to Tim Hardaway Jr. Now we get uh, Draymond Green in help on the drive and we end up getting to the opposite corner. This is a 22% corner three-point shooter, right? So again, 40% three-point shooter in the corner. 22% three-point shooter in the corner. And the simple passing lane closeout, and then a smart closeout from uh, Maxi Kleba's right around 37% above the break. So chase him off to, now you've turned this double team into the worst possible shot from Dallas, right? And again, simple difference in the way the floor is organized, a different type of closeout, it turns into a really good shot for Dallas, but a good closeout on the weak side from Brandon Podziemski, now we're getting a 22% three-point shooter shooting out of the left corner. All righty, this is a Kyrie Irving blitz that we see up on the left side of the floor. And we see Gary Payton's going to kind of just bait and, and he's stunting back and forth, just kind of trying to play on the indecisiveness from Kyrie Irving. But we do end up getting a pass to Tim Hardaway Jr. And again, Moses Moody has already bailed on the trap now. Since this pass was made, Moses Moody's already back into the lane. This gives... Trace Jackson Davis, the ability to get out and get a late contest on Derrick Jones Jr. and Moody can box out. 
Moody gets in and box out. And again, Derek Jones Jr., 33% corner three-point shooter. So again, the story of the game, and I talked about this last night, is Golden State's ability to kind of play Dallas into the lower quality shots in their offense rather than the higher quality shots. This next possession, I think, is the best example of the Andrew Wiggins factor. We're going to get Luka Doncic against Wiggins here at the top of the key. Kyrie Irving is going to clear down to this left wing. I mean, go the other way. I'm wrong. Here we go. Now, Wiggins has Luka on an island, and he's got all the space in the world. So if Luka wants to play iso ball, if Luka wants to play one-on-one here, he can. Now, Chris Paul's kind of sitting at the nail, but... He's got plenty of room to go right as well. And if he rips through to the right and then he draws Podziemski, he can get Kyrie's shot. Luka passes out of this. Luka literally does not want to attack Wiggins in ISO. He's getting rid of the basketball. Goes to Kleba. There's only seven seconds on the shot clock. Now Luka's going to get the ball back and all he's going to do is bait the trap and throw it over the top to Kleba. And actually, Wiggins, watch Wiggins as soon as he sees Luka pick up the ball. Luka picks up the ball. As soon as you see Luka pick up the ball, Wiggins knows he doesn't have to worry about Luka scoring now. So he can actually roll back and and guard Kleba. Kleba does a good job sealing Wiggins and creating a passing angle. But again, we're going to get a paint, non-restricted area jump shot from Maxi Kleba here. He is 23% this season on shots in the paint that are outside of the restricted area. So once again, Andrew Wiggins and him and his ability making Luka not want to attack him in baiting that trap is turning Dallas's offense into the lowest percentage shots or lowest value shots that they have among their role players. All right, we got three more from this game. This time we're going to get a Draymond Green double team of Kyrie up on the right wing. So we see Gafford cutting through. Draymond comes up. We're getting a straight up double team here. But again, we're, we got a 22% three-point shooter in the right corner. And some of this is on Dallas. Like Dallas needs to do a better job of like flipping these shooters to making it so that these options are a little bit more available there. Podziemski's coming in the lane to kind of help take away this. The easy, the only real pass that's available that's to a good shooter is to Tim Hardaway Jr. But we're talking about against ball pressure, like what, a 45-foot pass or something like that all the way to the opposite corner. And so we're going to instead get a little bounce pass here to the uh, uh, to the high post area where Daniel Gafford's going to catch. Now, Tim Hardaway's still open and he's calling for the ball. But Daniel Gafford, we're, we're playing on his natural kind of instincts here. He's catching and he sees a guy wide open in the corner. So he's just going to throw this pass without even taking the time to turn and look and see what else is available on the floor. That's preying on decision making. Again, Luca, outstanding decision maker, probably going to find a way to get it to the best shooter if he caught in this place in the floor. Daniel Gafford, a guy who's not as good of a decision maker, he's just going to play instinct basketball and take the read that's right in front of him. Now we're kicking to a 22% three-point shooter. Again, this is a pivotal possession in the game. We're 96-92 with two minutes and eight seconds left in this game. And we're getting a 22% corner three-point shot because once again, Golden State is leaning and, and, and basically shading their defense towards Dallas's less effective offensive players. Now, one of the ways that I uh, expect Dallas to counter this type of coverage in the postseason is to just have Kyrie Irving set the screen. So now if you're double teaming or trapping in any way, shape, or form, you're leaving the guy that's uh, that's immediately open off the trap as another super high-level offensive player. Here's an example of how that worked for Dallas here down the stretch. We're going to get Kyrie Luka two-man game. Luka's going to set the screen, and as Steph is chasing over the top, Wiggins' natural inclination is to help, essentially in like a drop. As a result, Luka's going to get a wide-open kickback three here, and he just misses it. Very fortunate for Golden State. But this is an example of a way that I think teams will try to counter, or D Dallas will try to counter these aggressive coverages as actually running the two-man game with Luka and Kyrie Irving. But we get an adjustment from Golden State on the next possession. Fast forward a little bit. We're going to get the same thing here, except for this time Kyrie is going to set the screen. So the way Golden State counters this is they just say, let's switch it. 
So Kyrie sets the screen. We get the switch. Kyrie spaces. Now, Luka has the matchup he wants, but this is where Golden State's extremely gifted defensive personnel enters the equation. Andrew Wiggins, absolute tier one athlete, unbelievable wing defensive tools, and Draymond Green, a tier one defensive athlete at his position as well. Watch Wiggins. Wiggins is ignoring Kyrie and sitting down at the nail. So as he comes down, Luka makes the right read, this kickout pass to Kyrie. Andrew Wiggins is one of the few athletes on the planet that can also get out there in time and actually make a look at that first step that he takes and how much ground he covers to get back out to the wing from right here to right there. He basically teleports to the wing and that chases Kyrie off the line. Now, Wiggins is compromised here because he's so far on Kyrie's left-hand side that just like we talked about earlier with P.J. Washington, there's a baked-in driving lane to the right. So Wiggins gets beat, but he did his job. He doubled at the nail and forced Luka to give up the basketball while also chasing one of Dallas's best shooters off the three-point line. This is where Draymond Green enters the equation. Kyrie's downhill. Draymond is fast enough to step up and force Kyrie to pass it off. And Daniel Gafford, who's just been jumping over Golden State all night, goes straight up and Draymond blocks him at the rim while getting the ball and saving it inbounds. And then he goes the other way and ends up actually getting to the foul line. So great example of like, even in the event that, that Dallas actually gets what they want, which is they finally get a switch and they get Luka onto one of the lesser defensive players for Golden State, the supreme athleticism and tools on the back end are, be- are good enough to chase Dallas out of those high-value shots. Again, down the stretch, it was consistently lesser corner three-point shooters, lesser above-the-break three-point shooters, Maxi Kleba shooting shots in the paint that he shoots at a low percentage, Daniel Gafford having to finish in traffic underneath the basket. It wasn't a lot of Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic working with great matchups on an island in an isolation. And that, that to me, again, comes down to foundationally, Andrew Wiggins and the job he can do individually on uh, on Luka Doncic to force him to call screening actions. And then all of the speed on the floor, especially anchored by Draymond Green, which gives them the ability to rotate on the back end. I, now, again, like I talked about last night, for Dallas's sake, not a lot of teams that have that type of personnel. And so I do think you're going to see actions where they can run Kyrie, Luka, pick and roll, get the switches they want, and the speed on the back line is not going to be as good to be able to hard double the way that Andrew Wiggins did on that last possession. And so that's why I say matchups are going to play such a big role when we get into the postseason. All right, we have one more topic tonight. I got a mailbag question, and I figured I I promised we'd do a mailbag today, so why not do a mailbag film session style? So here's our question. How do you see the Siakam fit after 35-plus games in Indy? And do you think the Pacers have a shot versus the Cavs? Slash, how will their game translate into the playoffs with their improved defense? So I've loved the Siakam fit. I loved it right at the time of the trade. I thought it was a specific positional archetype that they really needed. But most importantly, he gives them a legitimate secondary offensive option and the ability to utilize Tyrese Halliburton off the basketball as much as they use him on the basketball. So what I want to focus on today is Pascal Siakam inverted ball screens. So again, when I say inverted ball screens, what that means is instead of having a guard have the ball and have a bigger wing forward uh, center set the ball screen, we're flipping that and now the forward has the basketball and we're having guards set the ball screen. To give you an idea, in Toronto, Pascal Siakam ball screens, including passes, amounted to just 0.9 points per possession. So far in Indiana, they're getting 1.05 points per possession in ball screens where Pascal Siakam is the ball handler. That's a significant leap in production just because now he's playing alongside much higher level guards. As we talked about before the season, Toronto does not have the guard play to kind of weaponize this specific type of action. Let's get to the film. So when you set an inverted ball screen, The most usual coverage you're going to see in cases like this is a hedge and recover. The reason why is I've got Pascal Siakam here. I've got Andrew Nemhard setting the screen. I've got D'Angelo Russell as the guy that's guarding Nemhard. If I have D'Angelo Russell as the guy that's going to be uh, uh, switching in a case like this, that's a disaster. I do not want D'Angelo Russell switched onto Siakam. So what we're going to have D'Angelo Russell do is hedge and recover. This puts Rui in the difficult position of either having to drop back to cover that cut or stay up uh, in the action. Let's watch what happens. Rui, uh, D'Lo throws the hedge out. 
Rui does not drop back. He stays up in the action. And so as a result, Andrew Nemhard breaks wide open. Siakam hits him. We get a wide open layup. So that's the bind that they put you in there. Rui or whoever that is, is going to have to drop back to be able to help on whatever that cut is during the hedge. Let's go to the next action. This time, Anthony Davis is guarding Siakam. We're going to get the exact same action here with Halliburton and D'Angelo Russell, and we're going to get the exact same hedge. So as the action comes, here comes our hedge. On the hedge, Anthony Davis just watched... Uh, we, we know that uh, 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 the Pacers have been getting slip cuts out of that. So Anthony Davis is going to drop back. Because Anthony Davis drops back, there's a runway for Pascal Siakam to go into, and he gets into an easy pull up in the lane. That's a runway that's just not there without the guard screening action and having to deal with whatever comes out of that. Here's another uh, very similar example. This time, Rui Hachimura is guarding Siakam. We're on the right side of the floor. Same type of thing. Nemhard sets the screen. Nemhard slips. As Nemhard slips, watch Rui drop back. Here's our hedge from D'Angelo Russell. Rui's back this time. Remember on the earlier possession on this side of the floor where he was up in the action, which allowed Andrew Nemhard to slip back. This time, Rui hangs back. So as a result, as Delo's recovering, Pascal Siakam has a flat-out runway with Rui on his heels to get into the lane. Now, uh, Pascal ends up missing this layup, but that's a really high-quality shot that he gets, a downhill running layup attempt simply because of the fact that Rui has to drop back to deal with whatever that slip action is. Now, Another great way to beat the hedge is to simply pop to the three-point line. We're going to go into the uh, Brooklyn game for this one. So, as Halliburton sets a screen, Dennis Schroeder is going to basically... It's, it's not as hard of a hedge, but he's going to start guarding Siakam. And as a result, when Claxton drops back, Halliburton just pops outside to the three-point line and gets a wide-open three out of it. One more example from the Laker game. Similar type of deal to what uh, 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 Dennis Schroeder was doing on the previous possession. It's kind of like a soft switch. So as, as Aaron Neesmith comes into this dribble handoff, we have uh, Spencer Dinwiddie switching onto him. So LeBron and Spencer are switching this action. LeBron's going to go to Tyrese. Spencer is now on Andrew Nemhart, or, or on, excuse me, on Aaron Neesmith. And as Aaron Neesmith throws the dribble pitch, uh, uh, Spencer Dinwiddie's not even in position to hedge really much at all whatsoever. And so as a result, when he ends up switching like this, Rui's actually chasing over the top, and this pop for, for Neesmith is going to be open. But again, Siakam, downhill, already has the angle. This is a much smaller defender. This essentially is operating as a drop coverage now, right? Because Rui's chasing over the top. Spencer's essentially sitting back in the lane. But that's not a big center that's sitting in drop coverage. That's a 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six guard. And so Siakam just gets downhill and ends up drawing an easy foul going downhill. So again, we're getting... 15 additional points per 100 possessions out of Siakam pick and rolls just because of the high level guard play that that Indiana brings to the table. I've really liked the fit. We haven't even gotten into just the straight up matchup attacking in the post or the bully ball stuff that Siakam can do. Now, again, the defensive numbers haven't been that good since Siakam joined the team on January 19th. They are the third best offense in the league. So he's helped on that front, but just 19th in defense and 23rd in defensive re uh, rebounding. Now that's not on Siakam. I think the back, the front court has actually done a good job. Just the guard play right now isn't very good defensively for Indiana. As far as playoff matchups go, there's no real point in talking about it until we get a finalized set of what the matchups are. Right now they're lined up with Cleveland, but that could look very different depending on how the next few weeks go, especially with how well Miami's playing right now. So we'll see. But I do promise that we'll do a full playoff preview on whoever it is that the Pacers end up playing when we get to that point. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. This was fun. Again, thanks for bearing with me. It's a little sloppy right now, but I promise in time, this will get better and better. Going to try to incorporate this into most of our daytime shows because I think this is the best way for us to demonstrate these concepts. Uh, we will be back tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what we'll be covering. It's probably one of the games from tonight. And then also tomorrow night, we're going to be going live after the final buzzer of Clippers Nuggets on YouTube. So jam-packed week. I will see you guys tomorrow.